Thing one, two, there we got us on. Good morning, Lakeview Chapel. Hi. It's good to see you all here today. I'm going to just welcome us all in, get us kind of started off here. Um, if you are new today, welcome, welcome. And if you would fill out the communication card that you see in the, in the front of you in the pew, or if you're not new and you're, you've been here a long time, we still want to know whatever prayer requests you have, you can put those on there as well. And these communication cards go in the back by the little box on the wall because we don't pass the plate anymore. So that's where those can go. Also, if you're new and you need a visitor pack, we would love to get one of those in your hand. Tell us all about what we're all about. And... Um, let you know, oh, there's even a video in there. I didn't notice that. Cool, free video. Nice, all right. So pick one of those up in the back if you're new and you'd like to know more about us. All right, um, let's pray it before we get started. Hmm. Father, this is the day that you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for every soul present here today. I pray that you will draw our hearts to you and to you only. We are here to praise and worship you today in the name of Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus our Messiah. Amen and amen. Okay, let's stand while we sing. Oh God, you 
worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, God's house and to worship his holy name, isn't it? Oh, praise God. I'm so thankful for the family of God here this morning. I want to just remind you of a couple of family things, things that are going on in, in the church uh, in the days ahead. I encourage you to look through your bulletin at all the stuff that's listed there. Um, first of all, pointing out that coming up the end of the month, it's the 29th. Ooh, I should have written that down on the front of my bulletin, shouldn't I? Do you know what's happening on the 29th? Yeah, yeah. Yes, it's the blood drive. <laughs> and there is a great need for blood in our area. 
and I want to encourage you to, uh, if you're able, to, to donate. It's, a, it's an op opportunity for us to give back into our community, and we want to do that. Uh, with all the uh, things opening up, there are more surgeries scheduled, more things going on, and there's a great need for, for blood. And so if you're able, I encourage you to do that. You can do that online at the uh, redcrossblood.org whatever it was, dot, org. Is it? Oh, it's not there. Hold on a second. Yes, it is. There it is, dot org. Oh. I should read this every now and then, shouldn't I? I or not trust my memory, one of the two. Read your bulletin. It's there. Uh, I encourage you to, to sign up. There's a lot of spots open. As a matter of fact, um, uh, and when I was looking at it the other day, I got to tell you honestly, I'm a little embarrassed at the low number of people signed up to give blood. So, go. <laughs> you can put that wherever you want it. All right. Uh, also, <laughs> there you go. Uh, summer Nights with Jesus uh, is our, one of the things we were doing with our kids this summer, uh, just to give an opportunity to get together. But you know what we found? It is a great time for our church family whether you have kids or not, come on out, and you get to interact with the kids that will be there. And you know what? That's good for them. They need to know you, adults. Come on. They need to know you because you're living for God and you're setting a good example, but they can't see it. It's not any good, is it? So come on out. This is some, coming up on the uh, 30th. It's the end of the month. I know it's the end of the month. The 29th and 30th. Got me confused. It's the 30th, uh, and it's S'more of Jesus. S'more. So you can guess what we're going to have there? Some s'mores, right? So there'll be a fire, there'll be some, uh, some snacks, certainly some s'mores, some games to play. And just encourage you to come on out. Uh, it'll be here at the church that, starting that evening at 5.30. So make your plans. Keep that open on your calendar there, S'more of Jesus. Um, it's a great opportunity for us. There's other stuff there, and as you can tell, I'm not going to mess any of it up now because I'm just going to trust you to read it. Good? All right. I do want to uh, just pass on to you something else that was in the bulletin as we move on to our thought. Now, this is Mission Sunday, and each month we try to have some focus there for missions, and in your bulletin you'll note that there was a little call to prayer. And uh, this is one of the things that, we, that, as we talk about missions, is one of the most important things we can do is pray, is pray. Uh, and so I just wanted to read this real short one that's on there. You can follow along or just listen. But it's talking about a revival in West Africa. God sweeping through the countryside of the nation where we serve, the missionary is writing, calling people to follow him. Recently, one of our partners invited us to a baptism of 100 believers Getting baptized here publicly is a huge step, as families will often disown a believing family member and quietly try to have them put to death to avoid shame. So it's a big deal. One man being baptized testified that his family offered him a job and prestige if he would convert back to the majority religion. Other believers have been banished over or even poisoned. But in this village, whole families were coming to Christ. Praise the Lord what he's doing. Because the rains have not yet come, the only place the church could find to baptize the believers was a trough used to water the cattle of a largely unreached people group. What a testimony of God's grace and goodness. Praise God for the beginning of revival in this nation. We're asking for, uh, for more among all people groups. We're grateful for our local partners. Please pray for their health, their protection, and God's blessing on them. Pray too that he will send more workers and call new partners within the small Christian community here. God is doing great things. Isn't it good to be a part of that? Every time you give to the Great Commission Fund, you're helping to support and to send workers, international workers, to places just like this, where God is doing great things. And so I want to encourage you, uh, if you haven't yet, made a faith promise, do so. Uh, the, the pledge cards are in the back. Drop that in the offering box. It's a promise that you make to God, not to me. We, I don't know who made what and I don't need to because God knows. 
And it just is an cur- encouragement for us to be consistent in our giving. And when you, you know what I found? When you are giving to something, you're more likely to pray for them. Okay? So I just want to encourage you. The giving and the prayer kind of go hand in hand. Take care of that. And uh, be looking for opportunities to, uh, to be the missionary yourself. Because just because we talk about God working around the world, in West Africa, he's, he wants to work here in us and through us, to our neighbors, our co-workers, our friends, who also need to hear of Jesus. And whether it's 100 people being, receiving Christ and being baptized, which we go, woo, you know what? They make the same noise in heaven for one. One. Reach them. All right? I have a short video to share with you this morning uh, just to remind you of God's work around the world that you can be a part of. Es-tu arracheté pour Dieu par ton sang des hommes de toute tribu, de toute langue, de tout peuple et de toutes les nations? Chang Yaha si do yiga, ngote ga si ming hai ta gan hai sing king. हर एक कुल और लोग और भाषा और जाति न्यूयॉर्क Bangkat kan tu nom chong krup tang mano. Chong toi ko hơn 800 nhà thơ liên minh với nhau trong nước Mỹ. Nó adore bon Dieu, nó 38 lang ak patwa. Rau chen nam phen din khong phra chao ma tang yu bon lok ni mueun dang bon sawan. Мы представим надломленному миру надежду и примирение Господи нашему и Спасителю Иисусе Христе. 在神的宝座前敬拜他。Watu wa kila taifa uko jamaa na lugha. Biso toza to benga mi toza la bana nzali. Isu akain noi somush. And there before me was a great multitude. A great multitude. That no one. That no one. That no one. That no one could count. From every nation. Every nation. Try people and language. Standing before the throne. Before the throne. And before the Lamb. And before the lamb. And before the lamb. stand with all people from all nations around the throne of God. I can't even imagine it, but how glorious that will be. And so we pray. And so we give. And so we go to bring back the king. As they said in the video, Alliance family, it's who we are. It's Christian and missionary Alliance. It's who we are. Let's do it, right? Would you pray with me? Oh, will you pray for missions when you pray? Do it, add it on, go ahead. (laughs) Good morning. Sometimes I look at that and I realize, um, even last year I think of our troops and all our missionaries during that time, I 
I think we sort of got a taste of that, and I'm thinking of Helen and Tabitha and not being able to see Earl. Imagine all our troops and stuff that can't come home when things are going on like this, and the missionaries that are over there, but then the missionaries, it's nice to see the hope the pastors just talked about and people being baptized and the Lord showing, but to lead into my segment, um, it's we can't forget about home like pastor said. There's people around us hurting so badly. And there's so many people around us that aren't searching for God. They're like saying this is a punishment from God. And, um, and sometimes we have to, when things are going wrong in our lives and things just seem so rough and tough and you don't know if you're going to make it another day or you just want to go home, Lord, I can't wait for heaven. Um, uh, I was thinking, I listened to Jeremiah and I listened to Pastor uh, Greg Laurel, and they, they I got to take you back to Jerry Lewis. This used to be on the radio all the time, and I, you guys all remember some of these songs. There's a whole lot of shaking going on. Nowadays, they've changed that. There's a whole lot of aching going on. And then Leo Sayers made the one, You Make Me Feel Like Dancing. We changed that now to You Make Me Feel Like Napping. I'm going to nap, nap the afternoon away with the rain. And then um, Tom, I don't see Tom right here, but I, I always pick on my brother Tom. And it was by a group named the Tridents. I think I'm pronouncing that wrong. It says, it was that song that said, wild thing, you make my heart sing. But it, now it's bald thing, you make all smooth again. <laughs> so sometimes it's hard but sometimes we still got to have a little bit of lightning on, um enlightening when we go forth on those things as i take us into prayer and like pastor said let us not forget about the missionaries and thank god for what's going on over there i'm going to take you to isaiah 12 2. it says surely god is my salvation i will trust and not be afraid the lord the lord is my strength and my song he has become my salvation with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation second corinthians 8 9 it says for you know the grace of our lord jesus christ that though he was rich yet for your sake he became poor so that you through his poverty may become rich so much so. Thank you for our salvation, Lord. Psalm 1611, it says, You will show me the path of life in your presence in fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And in my Bible studies lately, I've really had to change it to the Lord really talking to me in my age. That for some reason, it says, I want you to draw water from the springs of salvation with joy, no matter what's going on. These wells are unfathomably deep. They are filled to the brim with my blessings. The worth of your salvation is far greater than all of earth's fortunes, past, present, and future. When your life in this world ends, you will live with me forever in a perfect environment, filled with dazzling glory. You will worship me with untold numbers of my followers, all of whom will relate to one another with wondrous love and respond to me with even greater love. Moreover, you will be able to receive love from me in imaginable, in unimaginable great measures and before the sermon started there's a song by Laurel Dazzler she says you know even when I feel like nothing you say you love me and it's so important even at home wherever you are God loves you no matter what at all times he always always loved you he created you the, the assurance of forevermore pleasure awaits you in heaven can help you endure your struggles in this world. I understand the difficulties you're facing, but remember, I am your strength and song. 
I am strong enough to carry you when you feel as if you can't go no further. I even enable you to sing with me on good days and hard days. I, your song, can fill you with joy. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, even in Ephesians 3, 17, 18, you tell us, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ. Lord, thank you for going to the cross for us, Lord. Thank you, even knowing that you had all the angels, you could have changed anything, but you still were willing to go to the cross and take that poverty so that my sins would be forgiven, Lord. Lord, we're living in a world that needs you so terribly. Lord, I lift up um, anybody's family members here. I just give that out to you, Lord, that if they don't know you, that they may come to you know you this week. Today is the day, Lord. We need you so much. You love for any time, any place that we are to just say, I need you, Lord. You're always there, and we thank you for that. Lord, I pray for our neighborhoods. It doesn't seem like we talk to our neighbors as much. And sometimes even a kind gesture of just going over and mowing their lawn or just doing something for them is so important around our house, Lord. So important for us as pastor, and we all should know, and even your word tells us to pray, even for our household, to pray over every doorpost, just like they did. They put the blood of the lamb over every doorpost, Lord. Lord, we need you. We need you so much. I thank you for all the blessings you've bestowed on us. Thank you for this church family, Lord, and so many church families out there. Lord, I ask you to be with all that are home and can't make it in here today, Lord. And I thank you that we can still meet together. Lord, we should never take that for granted. It could be taken away in the drop of a, in the blink of an eye. Lord, I just lift this all up to you. And even in another song that I've always heard, it says, take it all, because I can't take it any longer. All I have I can't make it on my own. Take the first, take the last. Take the good, take the rest. Here I am, all I have, take it all. And like the good old song used to sing, I surrender all to you, Jesus. I give it all to you, all my sins. I confess them all, Lord. We need you, and we thank you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Good morning. I'm going to be reading from the book of Daniel, starting in chapter 10, and then over to um, chapter 12. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar. The message was true and was about a great conflict. He understood the message and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three full weeks. I didn't eat any rich food, no meat or wine entered my mouth, and I didn't put any oil on my body until the three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up, and there was a man dressed in linen with a belt of gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like the brilliance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. Only I, Daniel, saw the vision. The men who were with me did not see it, but a great terror fell on them, and they ran and hid. I was left alone, looking at this great vision. No strength was left in me. My face grew deathly pale, and I was powerless. 
I heard the words he said, and when I heard them, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Suddenly, a hand touched me and raised me to my hands and knees. He said to me, Daniel, you are a man treasured by God. Understand the words that I'm saying to you. Stand on your feet, for I have now been sent to you. After he said this to me, I stood trembling. Don't be afraid, Daniel, he said to me, for from the first day that you purpose to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your prayers were heard. I have come because of your prayers. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me after I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to help you understand what will happen to your people in the last days, for the vision refers to those days. And then over to chapter 12. At that time, Michael, the great prince who stands watch over your people, will rise up. There will be a time of distress such as never has occurred since nations came into being until that time. But at that time, all your people who are found written in the book will escape. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to eternal life and some to shame and eternal contempt. Those who are wrong. Those who are wise will shine like the bright expanse of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, keep these words secret and seal the book until the time of the end. Many will roam about and knowledge will increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and two others were standing there, one on this bank of the river and one on the other. One of them said to the man dressed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, How long until the end of these extraordinary things? Then I heard the man dressed in linen, who was above the waters of the river. He raised both his hands toward heaven and swore by him who lives eternally that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. When the power of the holy people is shattered, all these things will be completed." I heard, but did not understand. So I ask, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these things? He said, go on your way, Daniel, for the words are secret and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, cleansed, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly. None of the wicked will understand, but the wise will understand. From the time the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up. There will be 1,290 days. The one who waits for and reaches 1,335 days is blessed. But as for you, go on your way to the end. You will rest, then rise to your destiny at the end of the days. kids can head out for junior church upstairs uh, in the nursery and so if you're on your way head on up and we'll be praying and God's blessing on you as you learn from God there as well but we as God's children want to learn from his word here this morning so whether you're here sitting in the pew you're at home watching on on the on video uh, we I want to encourage you look to God's word this morning ask him to open your eyes and your minds to hear his word from book of Daniel because here we are at the end of Daniel's book we've been going chapter to chapter looking at the events and the visions of Daniel's life a man who was trying remember to live for God in a culture that opposed his beliefs though through these chapters we looked for principles and patterns that can guide us today because we can't do exactly what Daniel did because we're not living exactly when Daniel lived but we can take those principles and patterns and apply them to our lives today as we try to do the same thing that Daniel did live in obedience to God in a culture that doesn't agree with us 
the last vision of Daniel is covered in these chapters 10, 11, and 12. And I, I hope you got the message earlier this week to read through all three chapters in preparation for this morning and had a chance to look at that. We've read only a portion of this morning, and thank you, Brenda, for that, uh, so that we can focus our thoughts on the message that God has for us in this vision that affects how we live our lives today. How do we live our lives for Jesus in 2021? There's a, a couple, uh, what we need to focus, what we're going to focus on is that there is a cosmic war behind these human conflicts in our life and that just as judgment is certain for the rebellious, new life is assured for God's people. And so we'll start with the first. There's a cosmic war behind human conflict. It all begins in Genesis chapter 3, this story. Go way back to the beginning. And all of human history is an outworking of the war between those who follow God and those who side with the serpent. That's what Adam and Eve figured out, or, or were experiencing then in Genesis 3. It's always been a war. Listen, it has always been the war between God and Satan. And the war was over the allegiance of man. Your heart, my heart, your allegiance. That's what the war is all about. Will man follow his creator? Or will he follow Satan? You've heard me say it before, and I'm going to say it again. I'm going to keep saying it all the time, so get used to it. We get to choose. We get to choose to be on God's side and benefit from his life and his power when we obey him. Or we can choose not to obey God and align, align ourselves with Satan. Listen to his lies and, and that God doesn't love you, and that God's not going to care for you, and that we can choose to follow that and separate ourselves from real life. And when we make that choice, we place ourselves in a position where we are at war with God. You know, I, I hear people saying all the time, you don't want to be on the wrong side of history. Let me tell you, I don't care as much about being on the wrong side of history as I care about being on the wrong side of God. That's what Daniel wants us to see here today. We get a glimpse of this battle in Daniel chapter 10 when the angelic messenger tells Daniel that he was delayed in coming. I heard, God heard your prayer and he, he answered that prayer and I was the answer but I was delayed in coming to you because a demon was fighting on behalf of the kings of Persia. And, and it just is a, a glimpse into the spiritual battle that's going on. We shouldn't speculate too much from this brief glimpse, but we do see that clearly there are spiritual powers behind various human institutions, both good and bad. This battle is seen in the Old Testament, all throughout the Old Testament, here in Daniel, <clears throat> as God fighting for his people and against their physical enemies. You, you read through the history of Israel. What, what, how did they know God was for them? It's because they beat the Philistines. Because they beat the Amorites in battle. Because, because God came, and before they even drew their swords, he decimated the camp of the enemy, and they ran fleeing. All those stories are, take a physical form. All those conflicts. But, they, but Israel understood it was God fighting for them in a physical way fighting against their enemies who were backed by Satan and his demons. In the New Testament, Jesus changes everything. You see, Satan is the object of the divine war. 
And when Jesus came and he lived and he died and he then lived again, ah, it was then that Satan was defeated completely at the cross and the resurrection. But man has been given time to choose while we await victory's consummation. That it was the end of the battle. I mean, Jesus hanging on the cross. What was his last words? It is finished. Exclamation point. It's done. This battle, over. You lost, Satan. You lost. So why then did God not just go, Whew, and done with everybody and all you people who follow Jesus, you come up to heaven. Why didn't he do that? Do you know? What? He wants more. He wants you. He wants you. He loves his creation so much. He wants that relationship with what he created so much. He was willing to wait. He was willing to wait. So that you and I, and in our past, how many millions of people added to the kingdom of God? He was waiting for those hundred believers to be baptized in West Africa. He was waiting. Even though the victory was complete, he was waiting for you. There are still spiritual battles being fought. Yes, Satan is defeated, but he's still kicking and screaming. And we see that in our human conflicts today. But unlike our Old Testament counterparts, we aren't sending out armies against our neighbors to destroy them, you know. At, it's not how the battles fought. Behind the scene of the conflict in our lives, there are spiritual forces at work. Don't misunderstand this in any way. There are spiritual forces at work. Paul was very clear in Ephesians 6 when he said, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. That person who hates God and gives you a hard time, your battle, your struggle, is not with him or her. It's not the enemy. Satan is the enemy. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil and spiritual forces in the heavens. There is a cosmic war behind human conflict. But like any conflict... There will be a resolution. Spoiler alert, I read the end of the book. Did you? That judgment is certain for the rebellious. But new life is equally assured for God's people. In chapter 11 in Daniel here, we was, Daniel received more information about the future, at least the future for him. Because remember, he was back in Babylon, and, and chapter 11 is talking about the conflict between the Medes and Persians and the Greeks. And so it was still 200 years in the future for Daniel of the rise and fall of empires. And like I said, specifically how Greece would overpower Persia. We, we talked about it when we were looking at chapters 8 and 9 in Daniel. But something interesting occurs in this explanation for Daniel. And I want to try to help you see this, how this works. When I would go hunting in the mountains of Wyoming, I saw firsthand something that my professors would try to tell me when I was in school. And I kind of got the concept, but I really, oh boy, it really clicked with me when you're hiking up and down the mountains. And I would go to places like this, where actually I've hunted in those valleys <laughs> over there. But we were up on top of a place called Freeze Out, one of the high points, and you could look out and you saw this whole valley. Paint Rock, the Paint Rock River ran down through it. And when you look here, you see the first tree line there. And you think, oh, that, that's just, and it, but it's down about, oh, 100 feet or so from where you're at. 
but it looks like it's right there. And it, it kind of is. But you get that tree line, and then you see the little grass beyond it, and you think, oh, you go through the trees and you're in that grass. Well, no, there's another valley in between there that you can't see. And then you get to that leveled off plane of the grass after you've gone down and up again, and you walk across there. Well, actually, I take that back, not to the river, because if you see along the, there's a little edge along the grass line there where the river is almost touching it, and you think, oh, the river is right there. And if I get there, oh, no. You've got to go down again and over across before you get there because you're looking at it from this vantage point, and that looks like it's right there. You can say, oh, I'll get through the trees, and I'll go over that hill there and, and get over to those mountains over there because they look like they're right there. That's miles and miles away. <laughs> and our professors used to tell us when the prophets were looking at the visions that God was giving to them, they were standing there and they were seeing this vision. And they were, it was like looking at the mountaintops. Go to the next slide for me. They were like looking at this. That was my shadow there, taking the picture. <laughs> but it was the same sort of thing where you're looking at one mountaintop and then the next mountaintop and then the next one. And, and they look like they're all just right there. But there's so much in between. And he was saying, when the, the prophets would look at these visions, they'd have these visions of the future, they would be seeing the mountaintops. And there was a lot in between that you're not seeing. So that when you read here, Daniel is writing about what was far off with the, the Greeks taking over the Persians, but then, he, then he, and it skips to the next mountaintop with this long, long break in between that Daniel can't really see. It wasn't meant to see. God just wanted him to see this. When you're looking there, you, you, you're looking past these different levels of landscape. My professors had warned me that such things, of such things while talking about prophecy, that the prophet would see those visions without being able to differentiate the distances separating these events. That's what happens here. Because as Daniel is recording what he saw <clears throat> about the, the Greeks overcoming the Persians, he doesn't necessarily realize there's a description here of the, uh, of the next peak that's beyond that as well. Because at the end of chapter 11, Daniel hears of a king who will do whatever he wants to do, that will exalt himself above all others, so much so that he'll even set himself up against God. Other visions like those in, in Revelation describe it in much more detail, but Daniel gets to the end of the story at the end of chapter 11 and verse 45 where he says, he will meet his end with no one to help him. Because the message for us is that God wins and judgment is certain. As we read in chapter 12, we find that so is the new life that's promised for God's people. Yes, there will be a time of darkness as you begin to read in, in chapter 12. Yes, there will be hardship. We'll need to be aware of that. <clears throat> we know already that our life in Christ is not all peaches and cream. Because as Jesus followers, we walk difficult, path, difficult paths with him. But as verse 1 in chapter 12 says, at that time, all your people who are found written in the book will escape. Satan's intent is to annihilate God's people. But God will provide an escape from that being delivered as opposed to being destroyed. Verse 2 then speaks of the resurrection at the end. When it says, uh, at the time all your people who are found written in the book will escape, many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. There will be a resurrection. Just like Jesus described in Matthew chapter 25, when he was talking about separating the sheep from the goats. He said the goats will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. 
As we said last week, the purpose of all of this is that we know that God knows. And we can rest in Him. How is that all going to pan out? What is your future going to look like? I don't know. You don't know. God knows. God knows every step of the way for you. And what Daniel, what he's trying to show Daniel, and what he's trying to tell us is that trust him. Trust him. We can trust him. He knows. He's not going to get caught off guard. There's not going to be some secret thing that happens that God didn't see coming. That never is going to happen. Trust him. Will there be things happen that we didn't see coming? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 2020? Anybody see that coming? But God knows. And he, oh wait, you know this part. Despite how things may appear, God is in control, right? We can trust him and rest in him. <clears throat> That's why God told Daniel, seal this up until that time. Why? Because he wanted the people who were going through the hardships that were associated with the, the Greeks taking over the Persian Empire. He wanted them to know that you're believing in God and you're going to be persecuted and you're going to be sought out and you're going to be put to death. The temple is going to be destroyed. All this stuff is going to happen. You're going to, they're going to stop the sacrifices there. And, and you're going to think, oh, well, maybe God wasn't real. Maybe God doesn't win. He said, Daniel, save this up for them because they need to hear it. Judgment is certain. And just as certain... <clears throat> is the promise of God's protection and deliverance of his people. Daniel shows us here that the spiritual battle is real. We need to recognize that. We need to be aware of it. But I want you to notice in all of this how Daniel responded to that spiritual battle. He didn't engage the demons of the kings of Persia. He didn't say, let me go get them. He left that up. He left those matters to God. The Bible calls us, as Jesus followers, to live a life as a, of a warrior in this world of conflict. Yes, it does. But the message is also clear. You don't fight alone. Don't try to. Don't try to. Jesus has won the battle. The way to victory is his way. And his way is a way of love and sacrifice. Follow him. Follow him. Yes, you will face hardships and trials when you follow Jesus. It's going to happen. You will face attacks from Satan and his demons. Remember, this is a battle for your allegiance. Satan won't make it easy for you to follow Jesus. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus told us very clearly, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Satan's objective is to steal your joy. Satan's objective is to kill your faith. Satan's objective is to destroy your witness by sending hardships and trials into your life that will cause you to say, well, maybe I don't really believe God's in control. He'll send lies before you that will say, 
Come follow me, it's easier this way. If he can flip your allegiance, he takes that as a victory against God. Our battle is not to defeat Satan. Our struggle is really with ourselves. Who am I going to follow? God is saying, come follow me. Jesus is saying, hey, look, I gave everything I had to, so that you would follow me. I will take care of you. I'll, I will lead you every step of the way. I'll provide you with everything you need to win this battle of life. And Satan is saying, did God really say? See, he hasn't changed his ways that much from when he did with Adam and Eve in the garden. Did God really say he was going to take care of you? Well, then why are you sick? Why, why are you having a hard time at work? Why can't you find a job? Why can't, that, those are the lies that Satan are going to send your way. All the while, he's pulling the strings behind to try to make your heart life difficult. And that's behind the curtain. He doesn't want you to see. But his lies are, did God really say that he was going to come back for you? Hmm. You see, the battle is for our allegiance. Will I remain obedient to God? Will I faithfully follow Jesus? Or will I be led astray by Satan's lies and choose his way? Because it looks easier. Because it makes sense the way I see it with these physical eyes. In the second half of John 10.10, 10, Jesus reminds us, that it is better to stay with him. Because although the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, he says, I have come so that you may have life and have it in abundance. Jesus came to give you an abundant life. The spiritual battle is fought for your allegiance. Here are the two options given to you. Satan wants to draw you away by his lies as an attack against God. And Jesus wants to offer you an abundant life here and forever. So yes, there is a cosmic war going on. And like it or not, you're in the middle of it. But God showed Daniel these things for a purpose to encourage and strengthen you in the midst of the fight. He showed these things to Daniel so that you and I would understand God wins. Because the other principle that we were talking about, judgment is certain for the rebellious, but new life is assured for God's people. And I say certain, and I say assured, because of this magnificent fact that despite how things appear to our eyes, God is in control. He said it, it will happen. God being in control does not, however, preclude our responsibility to follow Jesus. You can't say, oh, then I'll just go do whatever I want and God's going to take care of it. Ah, no. That God is in control does not preclude our responsibility to follow Jesus, to trust Him, to obey Him in our lives, to look at what He tells us in His Word and say, this is how I will live. That's what following Him is all about, isn't it? You can say, Pastor, I'll follow you home. But if when we go out the door, if you turn left, you're not following me. Because I'm going that way. See, 
I mean, we know how that, we know how following works, don't we? And we don't struggle with that because I'm a pretty big guy. I'm hard to miss. You can follow me. But Jesus, we can't see with these eyes. We need to know what he's told us in his word as directions, as guidance, how to live our lives the way that he lived his life. We need to trust his spirit who dwells in us for the purpose of guiding us in his way. That voice that says, here's the way, walk in it. That God is in control doesn't preclude our responsibility to follow Jesus, to trust him and to obey him. You need to understand from what Daniel is telling us here that there will be a time of great distress ahead for you. And I know some of you are sitting here and saying, ahead? I'm kind of like right in the middle of it. And And I get it. But for all of us, there is a time of great distress ahead before Jesus returns. And we need to know that. We need to count on it. There will be a time when you will have to live your life in difficult situations. And during that time, Daniel wants you to know, remain faithful to God. Remain faithful to God. It'll be so easy to compromise. It'll be so easy to say, well, okay, that's just a little bit off the way. Remain faithful to God. Because those who do... The promise is, those who do will rise to eternal life. And those who don't will also rise, but to disgrace and eternal contempt. So it matters that you remain faithful and obedient to God. Daniel talked about, they told Daniel, the the angel who was talking to Daniel called it being wise. This is the good choice to make. Be wise. Follow Jesus all the way through to the end. And did you read how he described it when you do? You will shine like the stars. Woo! Be a star. Follow Jesus. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness. That's our mission, by the way will be like stars forever and ever. Brothers, sisters, God is in control. He has everything planned right to the very end. Like we talked about last week, all those days, all those numbers, all, they're not supposed to be marked off on a calendar. They're supposed to just remind you, oh no, God, God has it written down. He knows when that was going to be. I don't have to. All I have to do is trust him. He has everything planned right to the very end. And he has given you the ability to choose in this life which side of the resurrection you're going to be on. The fact that God has scripted history and that the rescue of his people is the punchline is good cause for great optimism and celebration as I read earlier this week. God's passion is to provide comfort for his people. Understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying God's passion is for you to have a comfortable life. If you had a comfortable life, God God wouldn't need to provide you with comfort, would he? Now, God wants to provide comfort in the midst of our distress to all those who live in obedience to him in a culture that opposes his way. Every event and vision in Daniel points to that reality. Ultimately, we need to remember, we need to remember that despite how things may appear in our lives, God is in control. 
and he will win in the end. It is a certainty. So, engage the cosmic battle and commit to be a Jesus follower. That's how we engage the battle. Follow Jesus in a world that increasingly rejects that choice. Do it with great assurance and boldness in knowing that God will use you to impact your culture and point others to Him so that they can join in His ultimate victory. That is our mission. I used to watch a show on television called Mission Impossible. Anyone's old like me remembers that. And how it would begin, you know, they get the little tape recorder, like the reel to reel one. It was kind of fun. And, uh, and it would have a message of their mission. Here's your mission. And what did they say? Your mission, if you choose to accept it. Your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to follow Jesus. Will it be easy? Certainly not. Will it be impossible? No. Nope. Because he is with us. And he wins. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this truth from your word that points us to these important facts reminding us of the cosmic battle that is taking place behind the scenes of every earthly conflict. It reminds us so, Lord, we can pay attention to always follow you through those conflicts, to follow your way. And to remind us, Lord, we don't have to bring judgment upon those who oppose you. You will take care of that. We need to obey so that we will be on the side that receives the victory with you. And so, Lord, take these truths, apply them by your Spirit in our minds and in our hearts, so as we leave here today, as we face the week that's before us, we will see and understand and move forward in confidence, boldness, and courage. Knowing I am on the right side. I'm with Jesus. We ask that in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen. Let's all stand. There's a lyric in this song that we wait. We wait for him. like as a bride waits for his bride, her bridegroom. But I think when a bride's been waiting, she hasn't been just idle. She's been busy preparing. We aren't just to be waiting and occupying, but preparing. Let's sing. All of creation all of the earth make straight a highway a path for the lord jesus is coming soon call back the sinner wake up the saint let every nation shout of your fame jesus is coming Like a bride waiting for a groom, we'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing, even so come, Lord Jesus, come, even so come, Lord Jesus, come. be justice there will be you your name forever faithful and true 
who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is a lion. said earlier that we get to choose, and we do. We get to choose who we will follow. It's not an easy choice, but it is a simple one. You don't have to go to the grocery store and stand before a whole row of breakfast cereals and try to decide which one you want. You can follow Jesus. You can follow Satan. Now, Satan, it'll, following Satan will look like you're following your own way. I'm going to do it my way. Doesn't end well. Or you can follow Jesus. If you're here this morning and you've never made that choice clearly in your mind and in your heart, then there is no better time than right now for you to talk to Jesus and say to him I confess I've been doing this my own way I haven't even realized I was following Satan's way but that's what it turns out it is I don't want to do that anymore Lord I don't care if I'm on the right side of history I want to be on the right side of God forgive me Cleanse me. Take my life. It is yours. I will follow you. If you pray that prayer this morning, if you talk to God like that, He's going to say, oh, I've been waiting so long to hear you say that. He's like the father running out to his son, saying, I couldn't wait for you to get home throwing his arms around you and kissing you and hugging you and drawing you and giving you a ring and a new robe and saying, now you are mine again. Follow him. If that was a choice that you made today, please talk to me later, okay? Either this morning, send me a text message, call me on the phone, whatever, let me know. If you're at home, just... Send me an email, call me, text me. Let me know that that's a decision you made. Because I want to rejoice with you. And I want to pray for you. As you begin this journey with others who are Jesus followers here. If you've been a Jesus follower. But the Spirit has reminded you this morning, hey, pay attention people. Here's the way. Walk in it. And maybe you've taken a step or two to the right or to the left. And he's calling you back. Just saying, don't go there. Listen to him. Listen to the spirit in your heart. Confess that sin. Because when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. He forgives us our sins. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And follow Jesus. 
The stakes are high. You may not be able to see it today, but the end is coming. Follow Jesus. Gracious Lord, thank you so much for your word that gives us these choices, that points us to the truth and the true way. Lord, I pray that each one of us would take this to heart and allow it to transform us more and more into the image of Christ. Whether it's that first step of salvation or that sanctification that goes on and on in our lives until the day we die. Lord, do your work in us. Guide us. Provide for our way. So that when the day comes, when the Lamb took the scroll and the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one with their harp and golden bowl filled with incense, the prayers of the saints. May we be able to be ones who are standing there and singing this new song in heaven that you, Lord Jesus, are worthy to take the scroll because you were slaughtered and purchased people by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them, you have made us a kingdom of priests to our God so that we will reign with you. Glory to God in the highest. Lead us from your house today, Lord. For your glory and honor. As we ask it in the matchless name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Really now, let's go with God.